chapter 19. On the way to Jerusalem, Jesus was going through the region between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered a village, ten lepers approached him. Keeping their distance, they called out, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were made clean. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, burned back, praising God with a loud voice. He prostrated himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus asked, Were not ten made clean, but the other nine? Where are they? Was none of them found to return to give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, Get up and go on your way. Your faith has made you well. The word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Today's the second to the last week of this sermon series on the Psalms. It's now for the words to um, Psalm 40, the first 10 verses. I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me up from the desolate pit, out of the miry bog, and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Happy are those who make the Lord their trust, who do not turn to the proud, to those who go astray after false gods. You have multiplied, O Lord my God, your wondrous deeds and your thoughts toward us. None can compare with you. Were I to proclaim and tell of them, they would be more than can be counted. Sacrifice and offering you do not desire, but you have given me an open ear. Burnt offering and sin offering you have not required. Then I said, Here I am. In the scroll of the book it is written of me. I delight to do your will, O my God. Your law is within my heart. I have told the glad news of deliverance in the great congregation. See, I have not restrained my lips, as you know, O Lord. I have not hidden your saving help within my heart. I have spoken of your faithfulness and your salvation. I have not concealed your steadfast love and your faithfulness from the great congregation. Well, you may or may not be surprised to know that the most famous version of Psalm 40 is by the Irish rock band U2. For years, they closed almost every show with the song they titled 40, also known as How Long. It features the refrain, I will sing, sing a new song, to which the audience responds, How Long? To sing this song. Even though the band first recorded it in the early 1980s, it is still one of their most frequently played during live performances. I have no idea how many people over the years have realized that they are reciting scripture when they sing that song, but it is a powerful thing to hear thousands of voices offer those words that are both ancient and perfectly timely today. Watch it on YouTube if you get a chance. I couldn't use it as our video today because I promised that I was only going to use secular songs, so you'll have to hear that at the end. The new song about which that band sings and the new song about which the psalmist sings is the song of thanksgiving. But I don't mean the rote thank you, many of us learned as children that we recited at the dinner table, God is great, God is good, let us thank God for our food, amen. And it's not the self-satisfied thank you for the sunny weather 
for that anticipated outdoor event we've planned, or the good hair day when it's time for family pictures. Don't get me wrong, gratitude for all things, big or small, is a faithful practice to cultivate. But the new song in Psalm 40 is the psalm, song of thanksgiving that comes after the psalmist has been delivered by God from catastrophe or crisis. As with most of the psalms we've looked at this summer, we have no clarity at all about the particular nature of the psalmist's ordeal. His description of his circumstances, though, suggests life-threatening conditions. He describes waiting for God and crying out while in a desolate pit, a miry bog. In the Old Testament, the word pit often occurs in relation to Sheol, the realm of the dead. You might remember the story of Joseph from Genesis, whose brothers threw him in a pit, hoping he would be eaten by wild animals. Granted, Joseph was annoying. It was kind of a harsh overreaction on their part, though, when they came to regret deeply later on. And in Jeremiah, the prophet's enemies left him in a pit to die of hunger. The pit is literally the pit. Whatever distress the psalmist faced, God liberated him from it. He describes God's saving acts on his behalf. God turned to him, heard his cry, drew him up from the pit, set him upon a rock, made his steps secure, put a song of praise in his mouth. From a place of danger, darkness, and uncertainty, God delivered the psalmist to a place of refuge and relief. And the psalmist readily gives credit to God for his newfound freedom. And he's eager to declare his trust in God to anyone who will listen. Ordinarily, the cultic practice of the day would have required that his thanksgiving to God include some form of animal sacrifice, a burnt offering. But the psalmist recognizes that isn't what God really wants from him. Instead, his response is consistent with God's desire, that he proclaim God's wondrous deeds and make known God's mercy and faithfulness and loving kindness so that others might see and fear and trust in the Lord too. Bev read the story from Luke's Gospel of the ten people who were afflicted by leprosy. Their suffering was both physical and social. They were isolated from community because everybody thought they were contagious. After, and they were isolated from um, com, they were isolated from community because everybody thought they were contagious. But they were isolated. It was a lonely way to live. And after their encounter with Jesus, all of them were healed, all ten of them. You can imagine their surprise and their joy and their celebration at being both physically restored to health and being reunited with families and friends and neighbors and able to go to the synagogue again. Yet only one of them felt compelled to return to Jesus and say thank you. After expressing his astonishment, that only one of ten returned to give thanks, Jesus says to that Samaritan who came back, get up and go, your faith has saved you. And that's what it literally says in the Greek. Although our Bible and most others translate it, translate it something like, your faith has made you well, your faith has made you whole, your faith has healed you. But in the original language, your faith has saved you. All ten with leprosy were healed, but in Jesus' final words, there is a sense that the one who came back with thanksgiving was also saved in some other way. Perhaps, as one writer says, the message is that only those who properly respond to the goodness of God show they get it. They understand how the universe works, and so in that way show that salvation is operative in their lives.
Uh, My father was a quiet and restrained man, not prone to expressions of emotion, and most definitely not given to anything remotely resembling public declarations of faith. But when his doctors declared that he was in remission following months of chemotherapy and radiation for advanced inoperable lung cancer, he was a changed man. Um, This guy who for 40 years had left all of the communicating in the family to my mom, who had what he tactfully said was the gift of gab, Um, he began calling my brother and me regularly for no reason except to say hello. And he ended every conversation from then on with, I love you. He greeted strangers and friends and loved ones alike with warm, warm attentiveness. He enjoyed every new day and said so. And he expressed gratitude for everyone and for every little thing. He believed God delivered him from the pit of certain and swift death following his diagnosis. And that was his new song for the next 16 months until the cancer returned. And even then, as his health declined quickly, he acknowledged with both gratitude and wonder the gift of healing and time that he had been given. Time enough and strength enough and health enough to celebrate 40 years of marriage to his Gabby wife, to see my brother and me get married, not to one another, (laughs) and to delight in, for a few short months, um, his first grandchild, my daughter Laura. I'm going to assume that everybody here has been in a pit or two. A life-threatening or life-limiting illness with a grip of addiction, depression, or anxiety. The heavy darkness of grief, unrelenting pain, abuse, divorce, infertility, isolation and loneliness, imprisonment, persecution, danger, abuse, doubt, temptation, evil, unemployment, financial hardships, desperate worry about a loved one, or a string of bad luck. How you got there in the pit doesn't matter whether you climbed down on your own or were pushed or stumbled into it. Once in the pit, you realized eventually that it was just too deep to get out of yourself. There may have been crying. Surely there was waiting. You may have been fortunate enough to have somebody with you a steadfast companion while you were down there, somebody who could wait with you or encourage you or sit with you or weep with you. But deliverance from the pit, that was a God thing. If we don't, we can't save ourselves. And when it happened, your deliverance, how loud And how long did you sing your new song? The song of thanksgiving that God saved you from catastrophe or crisis or despair. Because, and I truly believe this, the capacity to sing that song, to tell that story, is the gift that only you have. And it might be precisely what somebody else needs to hear while she waits in the pit. Testimony is the church word for publicly sharing the private story of how God hears our cries and pulls us from the pit. 
sets us on a firm foundation and puts a song of praise in our mouths. In fact, I think it's one of the superpowers God gives the church to offer the world because others are waiting for salvation too. But we are so darn stoic in our suffering sometimes, right? So silent about it all. And then we remain silent in our faith. We keep it to ourselves. All too often we're willing to accept the help, but then we act like the nine who were healed from leprosy, who neglected to say thank you loud enough so that anybody could hear. Our delivered from the pit by God's stories and our gratitude are compelling ways to share the gospel, folks, even if you don't feel comfortable evangelizing in a traditional sense. We all have a story to tell that will give somebody else hope. Although I would add that when we make those stories about us, they're tedious. But when we focus on the character and the actions of God, they are magnificent and transformative stories. Think about it this way. The fundamental story in the Old Testament, the one on which every other story hinges, is the Exodus, the escape of the Israelites from slavery, their story of deliverance by God. And in the New Testament, the fundamental story on which everything else hinges is the resurrection. Jesus' deliverance from death by God. Ours are deliverance stories. Um, It was a week or two ago, I'm not exactly sure, um, CNN's Anderson Cooper interviewed Stephen Colbert. Did anybody see that or hear it? Okay, Stephen Colbert is a comedian. He's the host of The Late Show. Um, Stephen Colbert was 10 years old when his father and two of his brothers were killed in a plane crash. Anderson Cooper, the interviewer from CNN, was 10 when his own father died. And as a young man, he lost his only sibling, also a brother, to suicide. And then earlier this summer, his mother died. As the two shared their stories of and responses to the traumatic deaths that have marked them, a visibly moved Anderson Cooper asked Stephen Colbert about something he had been quoted saying some time ago, and it was actually a a quote from a book. Anderson Cooper said, You said, what punishments of God are not gifts? Do you really believe that? And Stephen Colbert, who is a devout Catholic, answered, Yes, it's a gift to exist, and with existence comes suffering. There's no escaping that. And he went on to say, I didn't learn it, that I was grateful for the thing I most wish hadn't happened, but I realized you are grateful for your life, and you have to be grateful for all of it. You can't pick and choose what you're grateful for. And then he went on to explain what he had learned from the most terrible thing that happened to him and his family. Compassion, connection, the capacity to empathize and to be with others in their pain, and the power of faith, his mother's and eventually his, to survive the initial loss and then the lifelong grief that has come with it. His willingness to give voice to the gratitude clearly affected Anderson Cooper, but I expect that it had a significant impact on others as well, because it seems to have shaped Stephen Colbert's reality. He has chosen in his life to sing a new song, since God delivered him from the pit. While you're watching the YouTube video of 40, you can also um, Google CNN interview between those two. Our song this morning that we'll end with is called Thank You by Alanis Morissette. 
She wrote this song some 20 years ago when she was a young person who had, um, was beginning to really achieve a level of fame. And um, she's a very spiritual person, though, and she had gone on a pilgrimage to India. And you will hear India as part of the refrain. Um, there are other things I, I do not know what she's alluding to in the song, like dangling carrots. I don't know what that means. Um, the words are on the back of one of your inserts, though, if you want to follow along. So, thank you, and amen. Amen. <laughs> 